Join me for a hymn sing at the 2024 Issues Etc. Making the Case Conference, Friday, July 12th, and Saturday, July 13th at Concordia University, Chicago. This year's theme, Hymns for the Battle. Learn more and register at issuesetc.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. If there was a one-stop shop resource for Advent and Lent, wouldn't you want to know? Well, there is. It's the Center for Biblical Studies from Concordia University, St. Paul, led by Dr. Reed Lessing. I'm Pastor Matthew Tuman, and I speak from experience, having used these preaching workshops. Offered online and recorded, they have it all. Sermons, slides, liturgical resources, and Bible studies. All for $25. Learn more at one.csp.edu forward slash Center for Biblical Studies. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. Impenitence is a big deal with God. He is so kind and He provides so many opportunities for us to recognize our sin, to turn from it and seek His forgiveness and His grace. But look, when someone simply refuses to repent, there they are warned that God is not idle. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Psalms, chapters 1 through 41. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. So last time, we began our study of Psalm 7 by noting that it was characterized as a shigayon, which might mean a musical lamentation, it seems to arise from the same time in David's life as when he fled from Absalom, since the complaint in the psalm seems to be the Benjaminite slander that David had basically stolen the throne from Saul, an accusation contradicted repeatedly in the way that David refused to raise his own hand or allow his men to raise their hands against King Saul, whom David always considered the Lord's anointed. He began by calling God his refuge, his safe place, where he could hide from those pursuers who were after him, ready to tear him to pieces like a hungry lion. David protests his innocence in regard to the slander that is being hurled at him and goes so far as to tell God that if he is guilty of this hijacking of the kingdom, then God can let the enemy have at him, overtake him, trample his life, and lay his glory in the dust. But he knows that he has done none of the things he's been accused of. So he begs God to arise, to lift himself up against his enemies, and to awaken to judgment. He ended with a prayer that the assemblies of the people be gathered around God, with God as the judge presiding over it from on high. Remember how Eusebius took that as a prayer for vindication from David's greater son, the Christ, who would assemble the nations into his church and who would indeed be given all judgment by his Father. A reading from Psalm 7, starting at the 8th verse. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and God feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head. 
and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Psalm 7, verses 8 through 17. Let us pray. Lord God, righteous judge of the nations, you expose us for what we are. Purge us of all sin, set a firm guard on our thoughts, and make us your people because of the just one, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to work your way through the remainder of Psalm 7? Let's dig into it. Verse 8. The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. If there is one thing that the Bible is utterly clear on, it's that for all of us, there awaits a judgment, and that this judgment has been committed by God the Father to Jesus. The Nicene Creed is simply stating biblical fact when it confesses, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. Another thing the Bible is clear on, God makes no promises about holding off on visiting his judgment upon the wicked prior to that day. Instead, the Old Testament is replete with examples of these warning strikes from God, from the flood to Sodom and Gomorrah, from the incident with the golden calf to the judgment that would ultimately fall upon both north and south kingdoms, Israel and Judah, and besides these, many, many more. So the one who will ultimately judge each and all, also at times, brings judgment crashing down into this world, and sometimes he forbears doing so. So yes, the Lord judges the people. Now, if we hear these words in the lips of Christ, we can understand him praying, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. But how on earth could David pray such a prayer and put it on the lips of God's people? We are far more comfortable praying from Psalm 143, Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. But David could pray both ways, because he wasn't speaking here of his personal righteousness, but of the righteousness of his cause against those who were seeking to topple him from the throne. The adored of Sire expressed it like this in the 5th century, I committed no wrong, in fact he is saying, against Absalom or Ahithophel or those arrayed in battle with them against me. And so, David can pray, verse 9. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O oh, righteous God. So in light of what we just saw, David is praying for a peaceful end to the revolt, and that he may again be reestablished on the throne of his kingdom. He prays this prayer in earnest, knowing that in this matter he's innocent, and thus he is not afraid of the all-seeing eye of God peering down into the depths of his heart. And of course, this is also the prayer of the son of David, that the evil of the wicked may come to an end, and that his father may strengthen and establish the righteous, that is, the justified, who are just, through their faith in Jesus. Verse 10, My shield is is with God, who saves the upright in heart. David knows that he needs a shield, and he is confident that that shield is with God. That shield is the one who would take on flesh from David's line and do so that he might save those who are upright in heart, that is, who acknowledge their sin straight up and lean entirely upon God and his merciful grace. Verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. This is another truth that the Bible never tires of teaching, that when God judges, 
It is always with a just judgment. We heard why a few verses earlier. He sees straight down into the heart. There's no pretense or humbug that can fool him. He sees what is, and what he sees leads him to feel indignation every day. That is, to feel a righteous frustration over those who persist in abusing his grace and refuse to repent of their sins, as he's about to make clear. Verse 12. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. Verse 13. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Impenitence is a big deal with God. He is so kind, and he provides so many opportunities for us to recognize our sin, to turn from it and seek his forgiveness and his grace. But look, when someone simply refuses to repent, there they are warned that God is not idle. He's not sitting back and approving of the sin. Rather, if you insist on having him as your enemy, he will come after you with his deadly weapons. If you insist on living in revolt against his appointed and anointed king, then you've set yourself up for a battle that you are going to lose. Verse 14. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. Now, this verse was obviously the inspiration for St. James' writing in chapter 1. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's an apt comparison with conception, pregnancy, and childbirth. Because sin, so very often, begins with indulging an illicit pleasure that proves to be, oh, so brief and passing, but that has longer-term consequences. And the worst of those consequences is when it has come to term and gives birth to a lie that we end up believing. That's the path of wickedness, and David knew it well. But he had turned in repentance from the path of setting himself against God and lying to himself that he could do so with impunity. Verse 15, He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. Verse 16, His mischief returns upon his own head, And on his own skull, his violence descends. Eusebius of Caesarea in the 4th century wrote, These words seem to me to have been fulfilled literally in Ahithophel. Remember, he was the man at the time of Absalom's uprising, whose counsel was defeated by David's secretly loyal friend Hushai, and who then, in disgrace, returned to his home and hanged himself. See 2 Samuel 17, verse 23. And similarly, Absalom ended up being pierced as his hair caught in an oak tree. See 2 Samuel 18, verse 9 and following. And in a similar way, Satan and his demonic hordes were caught out when they inspired and furthered the passion of Jesus. They thought it was the end of their enemy, but the trappers were trapped, and the violence they had sought to bring to him ended up boomeranging back on themselves. And note, on his own skull, his violence descends. It reminds you of the prophecy from Genesis 3.15, doesn't it? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So, as in the Passion, the enemy struck Jesus' heel while that holy foot ended up crushing the serpent's skull. Verse 17, I will give thanks to the Lord, the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. As David sees the justice of God being vindicated by those who oppose the rightness of his reign, as they are defeated and scattered, he praises the Lord, who has always proven to him to be a trusty shield and weapon. He gives thanks and sings his psalms of praise to the Lord who is the Most High and against whom all human revolt is a doomed venture. And so our new David, our Lord Jesus, having crushed the serpent's head and taken away entirely 
his ability to accuse the people of God since he shields them with his perfect obedience. He leads his people as the great liturgist, their high priest, in offering to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. Now, that's where we'll call our hiatus for today. Next up, we'll contemplate together Psalm 8, a psalm that the church uses liturgically many times in the year, and a psalm which Hebrews applies directly to Christ. The psalm is one big wondering at the care and love that God has seen fit to lavish on one kind of creature, on humanity, especially given the vastness of time and space. Till next time then, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.